Hey there guys, today's video is a discussion that I had with Robin Sullivan on the basic language of animal training. Now the goal of this video was to provide definitions of basic animal training terms and then more importantly give a layman's description or a thorough understanding of what those terms mean because a lot of the terms that are used in animal training can have a very dry definition or can be a little bit harder for some people to follow. So we wanted to go ahead, thoroughly define these terms and then make each and every one of them more accessible so that animal training is something that you guys can do. So I hope you guys enjoy this video. Hi there, this is Debbie Goodrich and I'm with Parrot Ambassadors. Joining me today is Chloe, one of our Parrot Ambassadors today. Chloe is a Blue Crown Conure and Chloe is here to demonstrate that target training is your friend. So we are joined by uh, Jack and Robin today for training tips. So this is one of our training tips we're gonna try to demonstrate for you guys to show you guys how Chloe target trains. So in this case, the presentation of a target is a fingertip like this. That's the type of target that I use with Chloe uh, to make sure that she is interested in engaging. So I reach out with my fingertips like this. She reaches and touches the target. I then give her the treat. And she did a really good job. Thank you, Chloe. Good job. With target training, I can take Chloe and I can manipulate her movement by saying I want her to turn around to the other side of me like that. And then I can get her to touch and try and uh, touch that target. And then I could do the same thing with bringing her back over this way. I prefer using my fingers like this because then I can use this uh, finger manipulation to do the more impressive, more uh, necessary tasks I need Chloe to do. In this case, Chloe is on medications uh, twice a day, four different kinds of medications that I'm target training her to accept. So this is one of the ones that she has learned and target trained to accept, and that is CBD oil. I just present it out, she touches it with her tongue, and takes medication. And that is why target training can definitely be a great asset to have. I hope you guys have enjoyed our training tip by Parrot Ambassadors, www.parrotambassadors.com. Enjoy the day. Hi everybody, it's Robin Sullivan from the Leather Elves and Jack from High Red Jack Pine from High Redbird. Um, we want to thank Debbie. Um, Debbie is a, a colleague who does a ton of great training, and um, she's got her style. And you just saw an example of that. And we want to, you know, thank her for sharing that with us. So tonight we've got um, another trivia question at the end. Um, and a giveaway. So see, we're, we're reeling in. You got to stay and get that trivia question. So Alicia, you got the kids there to help? Are they all ready? Um, so we've got, we also have a holdover from last week. So we've got a winner. Um, we asked you guys to submit um, pictures or videos of a toy that you turned into um, a foraging toy. Cause we, as we've said before, what's the motto, Jack, any port in a storm? No. <laughs> any toy can be a foraging toy. There we go. All right. So, <laughs> wow. You know, you trust them to give that right answer and you even set them up for it. I don't know. Anyway, we have a winner this week, and our winner is Melissa Davis. Melissa turned the ducky into a foraging toy. Pretty simple. Excellent, Melissa. I mean, she just took something that she had that she uses for some of the toys that she makes, and she turned it into a foraging toy for Zorro. So congratulations, Melissa. I will private message you after 
um, the live stream and we can talk about what you won because we don't have Johnny Gilbert to do that for us. Uh, so, so the thing that I we, really like about that one is that it really drives home that foraging toys, parrot toys in general, don't have to be the most overly complex things. I mean, a lot of times we see birds play, playing with these giant toys. We like to see them playing with these giant toys. But sometimes a smaller, simpler thing be just as engaging and you encourage a lot of natural It's excellent to point that out. All right. So, Jack, you're breaking up a little bit on me there. Um, and I'm not sure if it's on your end or mine, but we will continue with the magic. So that's my my phrase for tonight, that training isn't magic. I know it's hard to believe because Jack and I are so magical anyway. Um, it's not magic, but it can have magical results. So we're going to talk about why use terminology. Jack, do you use a lot of terminology when you're training? So if I am just working directly with an animal, uh, not necessarily, but if I am explaining what I am doing to another trainer so that they can be a part of that, uh, if I'm trying to teach someone on training, uh, that terminology does get to be very important. So it sort of depends on the circumstance. But it's not rocket surgery, right? Diane Hyde it's, wants it's, to know. <laughs> Definitely not rocket surgery. Can you tell we're getting you guys as regulars now? We we know, um, and we thank you for that. So terminology, in my opinion, can be good and bad. It makes sure everybody's on the same page. And but the thing is, I don't want people to get bogged down in that terminology. It's not. It's not. If you're focused on, oh, did I call it the right thing? Oh, is it? Am I doing the right thing with what I'm calling it? It can become a problem. So the point of tonight's live stream is to talk about some of the very basic language um, that, you know, Jack and I have learned over the years and do, we'll define those terms. And oh, in case you don't want to take notes while we're on the live stream on the leatherelves.net, all of these um, terms will be defined. If there, there's a place to go, you can just check it out and it's all right there because um, I don't. You know, it's like I'm trying to take notes and listen and and do all these things all at once. And I am not that skilled. I've told people before I can't use a clicker and train. So, you know, I can't walk and chew gum. But that's beside the point. Um, so we're going to start with something really the, the most basic behavior. So, you know, everybody's like, oh, I know what behavior is. So behavior is the way an animal acts in response to a stimulus. Sounds pretty fancy, right? Um, but Jack and I were talking about this and we were like, well, wait a minute, you know, that's kind of, we need a little more explanation. So Jack, how would you define behavior? So behavior is going to be literally everything. Um, anything that an animal is doing at any given time is going to be a combination of different behaviors. Yeah. Uh, so it could be something that you want to train. It could be. Uh, sorry. You're freezing on me. Your internet's a little weak. All right. We'll let we'll let Jack fix his technical difficulties. Okay. Um. So. One of the things that Jack and I have talked about is a behavior versus a trick. So here's one of those sentences to kind of commit to memory. All tricks are behavior, but not all behaviors are tricks. Does that make sense? It's it's really about, so you can ask for a trick, you can train something, but you're still training a behavior. But some of the behaviors that you're asking for are not tricks. It's just straight up asking for an animal to do something um, in response to that stimulus. And, uh, you know, there's a word we didn't even think about um, defining Jack, <laughs> which because Jack and I were talking about, we're like, well, you know, when you do this and you do that and it, it becomes second nature to you as you do it all the time. 
but it's not, you know, and you don't think of those terms. Um, so stimulus. So what's a stimulus? You want to define stimulus, Jack? <laughs> um, okay. So the problem with this, Robin and I have been working on these definitions all week long. And the problem that we had with a lot of the definitions is that you're not supposed to use the definitions of your other vocabulary terms. So a stimulus is something that provokes or encourages a behavior um, is how I would define that. Um, mm -hmm. And a behavior is anything that an animal is doing. So basically a and stimulus we, is something that causes something. Oh, that sounds technical. Uh, I, yeah. But that's the part. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be technical as long as you understand it. And if you guys have questions about any of these, feel, you know, ask them as we go, because it's easier for us to address them. Oh, Debbie's so cute. She said, your laugh is a stimulus for her smiling. Oh, nice. Thank you, Debbie. We made that <laughs> fun. Oh, it's magical. <gasps> Jack, your smile's magical. Okay, so behavior. We've got that down, right? We know what we're looking for. We're looking to elicit certain behaviors. We want our animals to act in a certain way. Any action they take is a behavior. So, okay, so we got that down. The next thing we wanted to talk about was a cue. So a cue is signals the animal that reinforcement is likely to be available for certain requested behavior. So again, sounds all fancy, right? Jack, do you, I, I feel like Jack is the translator. Jack, do you want to explain what that really means? So a cue is basically your way of letting an animal know I am asking for a behavior and I can provide you reinforcement. Uh, I can give you a treat. I can give you something that you like. And that becomes important, especially when we talk about things like parrots, because how many people have a parrot that volunteers a wide variety of behaviors? Uh, you know, they can throw those behaviors at you all day long, but if you haven't cued them, if you haven't asked for however you are getting your animal to do a particular behavior, then there's no guarantee to them that reinforcement is coming. But if you cue that animal and they perform that behavior, that reinforcement that you're looking for is very likely to be coming on its way. And our animals pick up on that really quickly. Oh, absolutely. I have, um, so I trained our dog to put his toys away. So now when he wants a Charlie bear training treat, what he will do is take the toy out of his, the basket, bring it across the room, drop it at our feet, and then take it back and put it in the basket. So there was never any need for him to put that toy away, but he created that need by taking it out and he expects to be reinforced. Well, in my eyes, I didn't cue that behavior. I didn't ask for it at that point in time. So the, chance that there's going to be a reinforcer is not as likely because it's not paired with that cue. So a cue is really just that, that request that you, you know, you're, you're giving that animal a signal, you're asking them to do something. And I think it's critical that when you talk about a signal or a cue, a cue, you really need to, it, to know that you're requesting behavior. You're not mandating behavior. So Jack and I had this conversation, the difference between a cue and a command. Huge difference. What do you think, Jack? So there is a huge difference between a cue and a command. And I want to be clear, it is not in what you are expecting of the animal. It's not in the information you are giving the animal. I would say it is more in the understanding of the trainer. Um, a command implies that you are going to force an animal to do something. And I think as many of us with animals have learned, there is no forcing them to do things. Uh, you can offer them cues, you can offer them reinforcement that they like, uh, you can request it, but there is nothing you can do to technically force them into what it is that you want to do. 
And we wouldn't want to do that anyways, because that could potentially damage your relationship with that animal. We have talked again and again about training just being a means of communication between you and your animal. You can make clear what it is you're expecting, uh, and your animal can have a clear expectation of what it would like to get in return. Maybe it would like to get a treat. It would like to get head scratches. Uh, and of course, that can be open for negotiation. Your animal may decide, I want something different. So mm -hmm. it's never something you force an animal to do. You don't impose your will on them. Instead, I would say it's an ongoing discussion. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's something that, that Debbie mentioned. It used to be a command. You know, back in the day, it was a command. Uh, but what I like to do, is, so I'm sure you, some of you have experienced this when you're at an outdoor event or, you know, somewhere doing an outreach or your club is, is showing people their parrots and somebody says, make him talk. Not going to make him do anything. I can't make him do anything. You know, um, years ago, I remember I was working with someone who was working with some big animals and then was working with birds. And this person was much more heavy handed with the birds than he was with the larger, the mammals, the large mammals. And I remember asking him why. And the response was, because I can. Well, that wasn't good enough for me. And to me, that was a command, not a cue. He wasn't asking anyone, to, any of the animals to do anything. He was commanding. He was forcing them to do it. And we really want to stay away from that, um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about the basics of training. So the other thing is a cue can be visual or it can be verbal. And I think we've got to be really careful with that. I've told you guys the story before about my friend who was training and drop the drop of a hand turned into a cue. So you really need to be aware of your whole self when you <laughs> make him talk. That's right, Darla, make him talk. Um, but when you, you know, when you are training, you've got to be very body aware so that it's not, you know, you're flailing around, you know, uh, go here, go there, target, touch this, do that. And, your bird is just like, what is all this input? And then you can inadvertently create cues that are visual versus verbal. Um, and sometimes you might want to use a visual cue. I mean, Jack, when you're doing shows, when you're doing outreach, do you do a lot of, of um, visual cues instead of verbal? So, yeah. There are going to be some behaviors that I want on a verbal cue. There's some that I want on a visual cue. And there's some behaviors that I will have both. The animal will understand two different ways of me cueing that behavior. Um, so to give you guys a couple of examples, uh, Grayson, my umbrella cockatoo that I use for a lot of outreach, school programs. We've seen him on here before. Uh, he does have a couple of different uh cues that I use for him for presentation. So for example, I'll take two fingers when they go over his crest. That is a cue to him to pick up his crest. Uh, I can use uh, something like laughter. He likes laughing on cue. So I ask him, is that funny? Funny is the cue that gets him to laugh. So there's a verbal cue. Uh, and then of course, if I want him to wave to people, I can either ask him to say hi, um, and that will cause him to pick up his foot and say hi, or I can wave to him and he will do the same thing. He will say hi, pick up his foot. So there's a couple of different examples on just one bird using both visual and verbal cues. So they, so it comes in a, in a wide variety and you just have to be aware because a lot of times you'll give a cue that you don't mean to. Yeah. Becky says the only thing she could make her parrot do is bite her. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm right there with you, Becky. That, that's, um, you know, and, and nobody really wants that to happen. And Melissa, I know you do a ton of training with Zorro. That's awesome. So he does the wave, the spin and the shake. And it's, it's, it's great. And you use both. And it depends what you're looking for. You know, in certain settings, you want to use a visual versus a, a verbal. Um, 
Darla says her goffins know she's about to leave the house before she even gets up off the couch. Birds can see all sorts of cues humans don't even what don't even know they're doing. So true. I mean, they well, let's this goes back to our discussions about birds being a prey species. So they're always watching. They're kind of always scanning to to see what's going on in their environment. And if some if you always pair a certain action like if going out the door for Darla is getting off the couch, which I don't know, that sounds like Darla spending a lot of time on the couch. Hmm. Anyway, um, so your bird has probably learned to pair that. It's magical. magical that Darla gets to spend that much time on her couch. I wish I could do that. Um, but yeah, we just it, it happens sometimes when you don't even mean to have it happen. Um, Adrian says, dogs seem to mostly focus on our body language, visual cues instead of what we say. I think parrots do that as well for the most part. And again, I think it really goes to animals are... I find that animals are much more aware um, of their environment uh, than a lot of humans. And they're more self-aware too, I think. Um, but that's, you know, maybe well, it's just my experience. You know, I think that really drives home too, that for a lot of animals, we've been talking about them being prey animals. Uh, but we've been, even with dogs and cats, which aren't prey animals, they are very tuned in to us. So I think it's important for people, especially brand new trainers, to recognize that you don't have to be over the top to get your animal to respond to you. You know, you don't have to have visual cues that are, you know, giant flailing gestures. Uh, if you have verbal cues, you don't have to be booming with your voice and, you know, scaring your animal. They're going to be paying attention to you. Um, so a lot of the cues uh, don't necessarily have to be something that you're immediately going to see because even if it's small for you, your animals will probably pick up on it. And in fact, as someone that does animal shows, one of my goals is to create cues that the average person doesn't even notice because it makes it seem like the animal is that much more engaging with me because I'm not cueing certain behaviors. They're just interacting with me one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. It's magical. <laughs> 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 so, what well, you know, I remember um, when Barb Heidenreich, um, there's, it's magical, when Barb would do, um, do training sessions or she would be teaching people how to train, um, she was always very quiet. She's a very quiet trainer. You hardly ever hear the verbal from her. Um, and her, you know, the actions are very small. The cues are, are much smaller than you would anticipate. And, you know, if you see a, a trainer in a, in a show or something like that, that's doing the big, you know, this whole routine and the arms are going and there's really no need for that. Um, that's kind of just the magic on the other side that like, look what I can, can create with this bird. Um, so, you know, I, my, I have a friend who's a trainer at Disney and he gives a cue and it's something as small as it's like this. And he gets a whole flock of birds to do a behavior. Um, you know, it's the cue to a, a group of birds. So it's really, it's just, it's kind of fun to see how small and how short you can make that cue. So that's cue. So we got cue down, everybody. We good with that? Going once, going twice for cues. Um, Debbie can't train and talk. Is that like walking and chewing, you know, walking and chewing gum? <laughs> um, doing that video was very, very hard for me to do. Thank you for doing it, Debbie. We appreciate it. Um, I, I would say doing presentations with animals, uh, especially depending on how many people you are doing a presentation for, definitely can make a difference. Uh, when I do presentations for groups of school kids, uh, that's actually one of the things that I have to desensitize my animals to, because I do try to be larger than life for the audience, but I obviously don't want to scare the animal that I'm working with either. It's true. It's very true. All right. So we're going to move on to bridge. So bridge goes over water. Bridge. Hmm. So the bridge, <laughs> which is kind of a good analogy, though. So a bridge signals to an animal that reinforcement is coming. It marks the behavior the animal is doing for the reinforcer. So it's not the cue. 
It comes after the cue. And as soon as your animal does the behavior you're looking for, that's when the bridge happens. And it, it, I, I like to think, so in a, vis, a visual in, or a mnemonic for me is a bridge. A bridge does connect two things. So this connects the cue to the behavior for the animal. And then they know that the reinforcement's coming. Yeah, I, I like to think of a bridge as almost like that light bulb moment. And you have the ability, if you're watching that cartoon, your animal is interacting. And as soon as they, they know exactly what they're supposed to do, you get to trigger that light bulb moment for them. So you're just pinpointing the exact thing that you want them to do. And you will find, and I guarantee you, every single one of you will do this because every trainer I have ever known has bridged and reinforced the wrong behavior. So if your bridge isn't spot on, you're going to reinforce something else. So if you ask for a wave, right? So you ask for the wave, your bird um, does this and then goes like this. What can you see my, and then goes like this. If you say good here, you're only going to get this the next time. You're not going to get that full on wave unless you bridge it right at that point. So have right. you had that happen? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, I said, have you had that happen? Yes. Um, I And that is going back to the idea that we've talked about before of having someone either watch your training sessions or record your training sessions. Because um, I can tell you right now, just like me, our animals are going to be as lazy as they can get away with. So perhaps you've trained an animal to do a full out wave, but it's maybe going to slightly push it until you're just barely lifting that foot. And if you're still bridging, reinforcing, you are basically training your animal that they don't have to work as hard. Um, the right. good thing about a, a bridge compared to just using uh, something uh, like a reinforcer or some sort of treat or anything like that. Using a bridge gives them that exact moment because if you cue a behavior and your animal is supposed to wave and it picks its foot up and then it sets it down and then it walks over to you to get a treat, the question is, what did you just give it a treat for? Is it for picking that foot up? Is it for setting it back down? Or is it for walking over to you? Uh, you just had a multitude of behaviors and your animal is going to have a harder time picking out what exactly it was supposed to do. So a bridge pinpoints it for them. And, and I think, you know, the other piece of that is um, we've talked about it, about training as a form of communication. And it's kind of like somebody asking you to do five different things. And then you think you might have done the right thing, but you're not sure. And OK, so, guys, it's that bad date that happens. It's that that. Oh, I'm getting all the right messages. Yeah, I'm getting all the right messages. And then you're like, oh, wait, what was I? What? Oh, I'm not sure. So it's it's really you've got to be clear or else you're going to have a, a bird that's like kind of offering a bunch of different stuff and, you know, not knowing what you're looking for. And then that kind of messes with your criteria. What are you asking? You know, if, if you're bridging when you're getting halfway there. Oh, well, then that's all you're asking for. That's your criteria. You set your criteria at a different place. Um, and the other thing about a bridge is it means nothing unless it's paired with a reinforcer. Um, a bridge is just, you know, bubble gum. I said bubble gum, Jack. You don't feel reinforced. See, now, if I had given Jack a piece of bubble gum, as I said, bubble gum, he might have been a little bit more willing to to participate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you and the important thing here is you could have given, you know, bubble gum as the bridge and then given me something like. Uh, a little Debbie Christmas tree cake, and I'd be even more excited. Um, oh. The bridge 
can be exactly whatever you want it to be as long as you work towards pairing it with that behavior so that animals realize that you give me this bridge and I get something that I like. Um, and it doesn't take very long for them to understand that connection between the two. And the other thing about bridging is, so people get hung up. Uh, it's For me, it's it's gotta be easy. It's gotta be something that you are willing to use all the time, a, a phrase or, you know, uh, whatever it may be. Um, it needs to be something that's easily reproducible and it's easy for you. You know, um, some people use a clicker. Um, Patricia says it, it can become a secondary reinforcer through pairing it with a primary reinforcer. Absolutely. Patricia, you're in um, training 201, not 101. I was just thinking, yeah, you're, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and the thing is, you want to make sure it's not something that you're using all the time. It's not a phrase that you're like, oh, you know, that's good. Oh, good, good. Yeah, that's great. Oh, it's good that you're doing this. How good that you're here. Oh, good. Um, mistakes do make us better learners, Debbie. Absolutely. But I think it's a matter of um, picking a word, sticking with it, and making sure that it's you're not using it inadvertently at other times. Because if you pair it very strongly with a reinforcer, or as um, as Patricia said, it becomes a secondary reinforcer, then you're going to have problems if it's a word that you're using and, you know, you're halfway across the kitchen and you use it and then your bird's like, wait, hey, come back. Um, Melanie asked a really good question. Does the bridge have to be a food reward? Um, so the bridge isn't the reward. The br and no, and the reward is the reinforcer. And we're, that's we're you're jumping ahead. You and Patricia, man, you need to like, I don't know, <laughs> have a little conversation amongst yourselves. So the rest of us catch up. Um, <laughs> Patricia's 301. I know it is. It's true. One thing I want to say about a bridge, because we've talked about a couple of different things. We've talked about whistles. We've talked about clickers. We've talked about phrases. All of them have the potential to be the best bridge for your situation but you have to figure out what is going to be the best instance for your situation. And with the animals that I train, I use different things as bridges. So for my pigs, for my camels, uh, I like using a whistle because for bigger animals, it gives me both hands free um, that, you know, if I need to cue your face over here and a foot over there, um, obviously on a camel, I need a little bit of stretch that I can do that. So having both of my hands free is helpful with that. So the whistle, I can do that way. Uh, the clicker works for a lot of animals, uh, especially things like parrots. I like clickers over whistles because I found that if I'm wearing a whistle, I wear it on a lanyard, I have a shiny whistle. The bird gets very, very interested in the whistle and they lose interest in what I'm trying to ask them for. So that can be problematic. Um, and of course, if you are bringing an animal out to see just a group of people, if it's regularly interacting with people, sometimes a phrase like good bird can be the best thing that you can use. So you just need to pick the right one for your situation. Absolutely. And so the bridge um, to kind of go back to Melanie's question about whether it's a, the, it has to be a food reinforcer. The bridge comes before the reinforcer. The bridge is what connects your cue to your reinforcer. Um, and then Tracy mentioned, I saw Tracy's comment up there a second ago that when Tracy was a dog trainer, um, people would show up with clickers and use them like they were playing castanets. Um, I think Susan Friedman at one point, Susan and Steve did a, a presentation called dueling clickers. Um, and it's true people it's just, yeah. And Adrian, it's not a remote control, but I think it makes people feel professional. I went and I got a clicker, I got a clicker. I can't use a clicker. And especially if you've got a bird on your arm or you've got, I mean, working with birds of prey, you've got a bird on, a bird with like some serious damage ability. Is that a word? Um, and now I'm trying to click and do this and do, yeah, no, it doesn't work. The other thing is the bridge for me is something that gives you a little window for those of us who are um, coordination challenged. Um, if you've got like a pouch with reinforcers in it 
And because you all know that if you've got reinforcers in your hand, the bird's not paying attention to anything that you say. It's all about that. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Oh, wait, something good came out of there. I want to go back. There. What's in your hand? So, yeah, putting stuff in your hand as you're training, unless you can hide blazing clickers. That's it, Patricia. If you can hide what's in your hand, um, that's what you kind of want to want to use. So, yeah, Debbie can't use her hands with the clickers. So if but the bridge, whatever your bridge is, gives you that time, that moment to go from what you're doing to reach into, now it's a word, to reach into your pocket or your, you know, treat cup or whatever and get that reinforcer out. Um, Cause yeah, otherwise they're just not paying any attention. Um, so Tim's budgie loves the clicker in a way that sounds like your whistle. Yeah. And it's one of his favorite toys, which I guess is, yeah, it is. It's there you go. That's a reinforcer right there. Um, if he likes that click sound, you're going to use that as a reinforcer. Um, and we're going to need to find a way, Tim, for the budgie to make that sound himself. Huh. That's the homework for next week. Um, okay. So we've got bridge down, right? We all good with bridge. Bridge takes you from point A to point B, from your cue to your, and our next, next vocabulary word for the week is reinforcer. So a reinforcer is the consequence that will increase the likeliness of the recurrence of a behavior. And you're all like, consequence, that's not a good thing. Jack, Jack, consequence is bad, right? So this has been one of the things that we have been stressed about. I do not even want to begin to try to calculate how many hours Robin and I have been working on this presentation this week um, because one of the issues for people is the connotation of training terms because training terms don't have the same connotation as the words as you would use them normally. Uh, so a consequence is not necessarily something bad that happens, which is how we would typically think of it. A consequence is what happens. So it is immediately following. You do this, this happens. So it can be a good thing. You do this behavior, you get something that you like. Um, so a consequence does not have a negative connotation in terms of training. A consequence is just what, like Jack said, it's just what happens. That's it. It's the, it can be good. It can be bad. It can be indifferent. The consequence, it's the consequence of that particular behavior. And every behavior has a consequence. Um, you know, you do this, this happens. You, you know, scratch your head, the itch goes away. You, you know, look up at the screen, um, people make eye contact. You, whatever that may be, um, it's just the consequence, okay? So, now... This is where, so this the reinforcer is what Melanie was talking about when she was talking about, does it have to be food? Um, and no, it doesn't always have to be food, but there are two types of reinforcers. She thought this was easy stuff, didn't you? Um, <laughs> so, so far we've gone from what you want to get done, the suggestion or the request that you make to get it done, the promise of the the affirmation that yes it was done and then how do you say like good job what's the next step yeah. how do you reinforce it, it's that it's gone from point a to point b to point c which is another way to put it antecedent <laughs> behavior consequence oh we didn't even go there, Jack, um, but we got to circle back around to reinforcers. So there are two types of reinforcers. There are primary reinforcers, <coughs> excuse me, primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers. So Patricia, jump back in. Um, the primary <laughs> reinforcer is biologically important, okay? So things like food, water, sleep, shelter, sex. Okay. And this is a PG show because I know that Aislinn and Connor are with us. So um, 
there's so much that could be said there. But so those are your primary reinforcers. Jack, do you right. find and primary reinforcers better? So I would say there's a, a wide range of primary reinforcers that you listed, and not all of them are going to be immediately useful for the average person in their training situation. Uh, I, I can't even put together a scenario where the average bird owner is going to offer sleep as a reinforcer um, for one of their animals. But it is, it is a primary reinforcer. It is something that your animal has a biological imperative to pursue. So uh, I would say that food for a lot of animals does have a really good potential to be uh, a good starting point as a primary reinforcer. Because you know your animal is going to need food. Uh, and typically, if you've been interacting with them, you can find a food that they really like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, with food, it's interesting because you've got to be careful that you're not satiating your animal um, by giving them too much each time you give them a cue. So if you cue a behavior and you bridge it, good job. And then you hand over um, a whole walnut in a shell. Yeah, good luck getting another repetition um, because now the bird's going to take it out of the shell. They're going to put it in their beak. They're going to manipulate it around a while. They're going to chew on one half of it. And yeah, now all this time has passed. And if you only want one repetition, go for the walnut. But if you don't, take that walnut and break it up into teeny tiny pieces and then deliver that teeny tiny reinforcer. Um, the other thing is different animals respond differently to, to food as a reinforcer. So an animal that like a snake, Jack, would you use food as a reinforcer with a snake? So the problem with the snake is that they eat one large meal at very, you know, extended durations of time. Like they'll go a week, a week and a half, two weeks without eating. So in that instance, food doesn't have the potential to be the best reinforcer for that animal. Yeah, it's the same with birds of prey. Um, they'll, they'll, they will work for food, but it's not, it's not a, always super effective. And it's tough to find reinforcers for birds of prey. Um, you just have to be very aware of what gets that behavior going and what doesn't. Um, there's a conversation going on and discussion here about whether social interaction um, is a primary reinforcer. <clears throat> and yes, it is. Um, you know, it's it's social interaction. Um, it's part of the formation. Yes, yeah. Um, companionship is a primary reinforcer. So, you know, sometimes you've got that bird that just wants to hang out with you. And that that is a primary reinforcer. The second kind of reinforcer that we need to talk about, species specific, absolutely, Patricia. The second type of reinforcer we need to talk about is secondary reinforcers. So they're significant to the animal, <clears throat> excuse me, but they are not essential. So you can't get by without food, water, sleep, shelter, and sex. Oh, there's so much to say. Um, but you can get by without things like verbal praise. It's more important to some people than others. Um, you know, clearly Jack and I are reinforced by viewership. I'm just saying, tell your friends. Um, it's a secondary, re it might be a primary for us. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then things like scratches, things like toys. The list of secondaries goes on and on and on. And it's really about determining what flips that switch for your bird. And yeah, I think it's important to point out here that all of these things that we're talking, I mean, primary reinforcers are pretty straightforward. Secondary reinforcers are going to be incredibly individual specific. So you need to figure out what is going to serve as a reinforcer for your animal. And it may not be the same things that serve as a good secondary reinforcer for another animal or another species. 
Right. Absolutely. It's, and this goes back to, it's a study of one, you know, when you're doing training, you really have to be aware of what is working and what's not. Um, Adrian says, Oh my gosh, I have this discussion when I do a behavior workshop, show a peanut and ask how much is this, how much is a reinforcer? People are surprised when I show them a quarter or a half of a peanut. It's true. You know, I like to think about it. So if you had, so for me, chocolate chip cookies would be pretty reinforcing. I would, that would, I, I, I would do a lot of things for chocolate chip cookies. And, um, but if you gave me a chocolate chip cookie, the size of a banquet table, like a 10 seater at a banquet, you guys all remember what it's like to get together with 10 people. Um, I would still be really excited, but I'm not going to do anything else for you besides that one thing. Um, <laughs> because that's like giving, you know, if you give a bird a, a whole walnut, you're giving them like, half of a banquet table because they're going to be satiated. It's really, you know, some birds will work and work and work for that. Um, but that's, it's rare. You know, you really want to make sure that, you know, if there's a, if it's a, something new that you're training and we can, we're not going to get into jackpotting for behavior because that's a whole night's talk. Um, but you can, you can up how much reinforcer you're giving. But, you know, you've got to see what the value of the reinforcer is. And, and it varies from bird to bird. Um, so, all right, we've got primary and secondary reinforcers. Um, yeah, you are. Debbie's right. You could you would be surprised at how hard they'll work for a half a sunflower seed. It's true. Um, it's way, you know, that whole thing about work for peanuts. It's true. So some of our guys do. Um, come on, Jack, you were an elephant trainer. Work with me here. Um, <laughs> all right. So the next one is another one that we're going to get some <gasps> when we talk about this one. So punishment. Okay. Punishment. It's the consequence that decreases the likelihood of the recurrence of a behavior. So now we've got consequence and punishment in the same same box. This is, this is terrifying. Um, Jack is punishment a tool. So yeah, I would say punishment is most definitely a tool that can be used in training your animal. And I would even go one step further and say punishment is a tool that most people are probably already using in training their animal. Um, now punishment you know, the, the connotation of punishment is, oh, this is a this is a mean thing. I am I am punishing you. And no, punishment is something you are doing to diminish the possibility of a behavior happening in the future. Um, so, for example, I have a new bird that I am working with. One of the things he has learned is he is going to go on my arm. He'll climb up to my shoulder and then he likes to try to nibble on my ears. And believe it or not, I don't like to have my ears nibbled on by a bird. So one of the things that I do, one of the things that many of us are taught with birds is when that bird is doing that, if I want him off my shoulder, I drop my shoulder. And that movement causes him to fly over to his perch and he doesn't bite me on my ear. So I have punished the bird. Uh, I don't think anyone would say that I've done anything mean to that bird, but I have diminished the behavior that I do not like, the biting me on my ears. Absolutely. And I think, you know, so again, in the discussions going on here on the, the chat, that um, it, this is something that's t really hard for people to get over or to get through. Um, there, are, So there are four type well that's the next definition but so there's punishment and there's reinforcement and those are two form <clears throat> they're two tools um patricia says an individual defines what's reinforcing absolutely um but so there's punishment and there's reinforcement and they are both tools that you have in your toolbox as a trainer um the sustainability of a behavior is not, I mean, reinforcement, po you know, positive reinforcement is definitely the way to go to, to maintain a behavior. 
but the other tools are definitely available. Okay. So the next level, so now we've talked about reinforcement and punishment. Jack, do you have anything else to add about that? No, I was just going to say, we already started to hint on it with the idea of positive reinforcement. And I know a lot of people latch onto that term because positive is a good word. Reinforcement is a good word. So you put it together and that's two really good words. But again, the connotation that we're using isn't the same for training as it is for basic English. So uh, I think it's important that we go into what is the difference between positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And Patricia says you could redirect widget instead of dropping your shoulder, which is definitely a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. So positive, it, it, when you put positive with reinforcement or punishment, all it means is adding to the environment. That's it. So think of positive as a plus sign. So you're adding something to the environment. Um, negative is removing something from the environment. So minus, okay? It's it's really, and it, again, all of this is, st it's still part of the basics, but we're kind of down there. We need to go down that rabbit hole a little bit further before we get to this. So Positive reinforcement is adding something to the environment. And now you've got reinforcement and reinforcement is something that increases the likelihood of a behavior. So you're adding something to the environment that will increase the likelihood of a behavior. That's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is removing something from the uh, removing something from the environment. So you have to think about this. Removing something <laughs> from the environment um, that will decrease the likelihood of a behavior. Okay. So it's putting those two terms to get, yes, no, you're shaking your head. Negative reinforcement is taking away something from the environment that would increase the behavior. Right. Because right. negative is Re taking and reinforcement is yes. increasing the likelihood of the behavior. Okay. So see, it's, it's, it's confusing. And again, um, and again you do, it's not about analyzing all these terms. It's just knowing how to use them and using them at the right time. Right. And, you know, a couple of things for people to remember. All of these do have the potential to be useful tools for dealing with different behaviors, for seeking the behaviors that you are looking for. Um, and another thing I think we should point out, I am pretty sure me and Robin have driven some people absolutely crazy when they'll present us with something like, my bird is yelling. How do I get my bird? How, how do I get the bird to stop yelling? And we'll ask, well, what do you want the bird to do instead? And they're like, I want it to stop yelling. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're asking. What do you want it to do instead? And the reason we ask that is because you can go down any of these paths to change that behavior. So if you want the bird to sit on a perch and stay quietly, that's going to be one behavior. If you want the bird to learn to say some words softly as they're around you, that's gonna be another behavior. All of these are going to be different ways that you can pr approach an individual behavior. Um, and all of these could potentially utilize, uh, maybe one uses positive reinforcement and the other uses negative punishment. But we're all still in the realm of operant conditioning. There is some kind of consequence for a behavior. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, punishment and reinforcement are very subjective as well. There's a very subjective nature to those two terms because so I bet there are people out there whose birds love being sprayed by a spray bottle. Right? So what is that then? That sounds like it would be a reinforcer. It sounds like it would be something that animal likes that you know, if they're excited about it, that may encourage them to redo those behaviors. Right. So then you've got that bird, um, like my kayak used to be, that um, the spray bottle clearly was full of battery acid. 
So it was not, yeah. Oh, you brought out the water bottle like for a bath and my Nikki was just, you know, screaming the Kaik death scream. So then what would it be then? Well, okay. But I thought we just decided it was a reinforcer, but the way you're describing it for this bird sounds like it would be a punishment because if the bird is trying to avoid the spray bottle, then it is probably going to avoid whatever behavior caused the spray bottle to be brought out, which would make it a punishment and not a reinforcer. So hmm. are you saying the same exact thing can be a, po a reinforcer for one animal and a punishment for another? Absolutely. And this is, again, we need to look at that individual and see what flips the switch. Okay, so we've got down positive, negative, reinforcement, punishment. Now we need to move on to shaping. So shaping, <laughs> shaping is the reinforcement of successive approximations of a desired behavior. And it's building a complete behavior. Jack, do you want to translate that? <laughs> All right. Um, I will tell you guys right now, coming up with the definition of shaping, uh, Robin and I both had a borderline existential crisis as we're discussing it and talking about it. And the definition makes it seem so crazy. And so... An approximation is a step of a behavior, a single component. Um, and shaping is developing that behavior to where you want it to be. Um, so, for example, uh, if I wanted to reinforce myself for making coffee, coffee is the behavior that I am aiming for. The first approximation could be filling the kettle with water. Um, that, that is the first step that is needed in making coffee. Um, and no, 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 I'm I... stopping right there. Oh. So if we're talking really tiny approximations, it's going into the kitchen if that's where the coffee pot is. Well, and, and, and some sometimes, days, yeah, you, you are going to have to, to figure out some days you're going to have a giant approximation. I might grab the kettle, fill it with water and put it back. Um, and that's great. And some days, yeah, I, I looked at the kitchen. Um, I'm kind of wary of the kitchen. I looked at the kitchen. That is an approximation for the overall behavior. So it's just going to depend on your individual animal. Um, and some days it may just depend on the day of the week. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I can tell you, and it really... As your training skills develop, um, you'll find that you read approximations better. And, and Patricia says she loves shaping. Shaping, it's, it's the coolest thing when you get it, you know, when you get it down and you see it working, it's really cool. And then Debbie's talking about getting out of bed is the first approximation. And she's right. But Steve Martin is someone who um, is able to take approximations and he's got this kind of innate sense that he's aware of, okay, I have to do really tiny approximations with this bird. Oh wait, you know, we're going to take that giant leap of faith and we're going to go to this huge approximation. And he somehow gets that behavior to happen. Um, you know, he, he seems to have a flair for that. Um, and I think it's really about as you're, you're, um, skills develop. And Melissa, it's really not difficult. You're doing it. I know you're doing it anyway. You're taking those small steps with Zorro and then, you know, seeing you're building them up. Um, Patricia says, define what you want the final behavior to look like. What does the animal already do? What is the first step? Yeah, it's true. And, and you build from there. And, you know, that's another good point, Patricia, is you don't want to do something that's completely out of your bird's wheelhouse. You can't ask a bird to do something that's just, it's not a natural behavior. It's not an extension of a natural behavior. You've got to have that, that kind of history to, to be able to move forward. Any animal. And every, 
single card is going to have a different starting point as well. So again, as we've said before, we're going to keep saying it really is a study of one. We can give you a hint of an idea of where to go, but you really need to apply all of these ideas to your individual situation, your individual animal. Absolutely. Um, so approximations, we were going to define approximations, but I think we took care of that. That's kind of exciting. Um, and approximations, you've got to just read the situation. You know, it's part of being a good trainer. We talked about, you know, watching, being aware of yourself. We talked about, um, you know, just deciding what's a, what's a really good um, reinforcer. And I think part of it too, is being able to read those approximations. And sometimes you need to take a step backwards and it's not a bad thing. Um, but you've got to be honest as a trainer for yourself. Don't you think Jack? Yeah. And I mean, there, there's a couple of different ways that you can take that step backwards. Um, you can, Robin and I have pushed time and time again. If you're training an animal, if you record your training sessions, you can look and you can see what exactly you are doing. You can reach out to other people to uh, say, hey, can you watch this? Can you tell me what you think? Can you see, is there something that I am missing? You can document uh, what it is that you are working on. Um, so that way you then have a, you know, documentation of how much progress you've made. Um, and sometimes I will say that you sometimes need to just reevaluate whether or not that overall behavior is worth what you are putting into it. Because there are times where you just decide, oh, hey, I really wanted this animal to... Uh, a wing flap is a great behavior uh, that a lot of people love to see. And if you're working on that and you get your bird to just hold its wings out completely, you know, that's not a flap. That's not the finished behavior. I would say it would be one step on to getting that behavior. But you may realize this behavior is more useful to me. I get to completely look at the underside of my bird's wings, mm -hmm. check them for function. So you may realize as you are doing your training that this new behavior that you've come up with, which is just a step onto the behavior you were working for, is ultimately better. Um, and that happens all the time. Well, and I think, too, you know, we've talked a lot uh, on other um, live streams about being bird centric. We really want it to, you know, our training and our enrichment and just the environment. We want it to be bird centric. And, and workable for us at the same time. And I think when you're doing training, you really need to look at, is this fulfilling a need for the bird as well? Or is it just something I want? You know, I want my bird to sing Yankee Doodle. Well, what's the real purpose? You know, um, it's that old, you can teach a pig to sing kind of thing. No, wait, yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really I about, <laughs> I know it's true. Um, but you really have to look at what's okay. What's in it for that bird? What's in it? Why is this bird doing this? Um, and I think you really want to, um, to make sure there's a point to it, that it's not just, you know, that fancy behavior. It's, you know, like Jack said, wings up, you can, you can look at the wings underneath. Um, a wave, you can assess the bottom of their feet. Um, you know, uh, a yawn or you, if you, well, yawn is, is probably a tough one, but a yawn, you can get them to open their mouth. So you can look inside their mouth and see what's going on. Um, you know, there are so many different functions that can come out of those fun behaviors, but you've really got to think about what's the priority when you decide you want to do some training. Right. And the behaviors that you are doing, you may be doing the same exact behavior as someone else, but for a completely different reason. So I know one of the things that Debbie showed us in the video at the very beginning was a turnaround, which a lot of people do like to see that just because it's you have this relationship with a bird, you get it to turn in a circle. Um, they typically think of that as something that, you know, like a dog does. But you can use that in so many different ways. You can use a turnaround to see the feathers, the back of the head, the back of the bird's body. 
Uh, if you get older birds, birds that have arthritis, you can use a turnaround to assess how their dexterity is functioning as they turn around on a perch. So you can get multiple uses out of a single behavior. Absolutely. Um, okay, so that's the down and dirty on behavior language, on training the training language, the, the really basic ones that, you know, you can throw those out and they'll they'll get you pretty far in a training discussion. Um, but, you know, there's there are so many more and we could this could go on for hours and hours, but it's Friday night. and We don't want to keep you guys because everybody's going places. Right. Someday we will promise. Um, but we did promise a trivia question. So. I'm going to, so, so we don't have any issues. What does the bridge mark? And so Nick is going to tell us who answers first. Well, and I, I just, I think it's so good that we were able to address all of these different topics because I know a lot of people can be really intimidated by the idea of training. And especially the terminology can make training a little bit out of reach. Uh, so hopefully that this session has done a lot for people so that it seems a little more accessible. Because I guarantee you, this is something that people are doing and using whether or not they know the exact terminology. So something like bridge, um, you know, is, is, is a good thing to know. Okay, let's see. What have we got for answers, Nick? The answer is, are we ready for the answer? The answer is the behavior that an animal is being reinforced for. Did we come close? Who's got that? Who came up with that first or something? Let's see. Okay. I don't know if my, if they're coming in, I never know um, the behavior you want. Okay. Well, right. right. And that, well, that works. This for, is my real. Is that, is that what you're, is that what we're going with? So Nick, is that, so completion of a cue. Close that, Diane, but. That one was first that came in and then. Okay. Um, uh, Melissa Davis says reinforcer. Okay. And then the reinforcer the, comes after the bridge. The behavior of the white shelly. Okay. Then, I Eddie think Goodrich we're going to go. The point where the animal got right. So. <clears throat> Whoa. All right. You know what? See, you guys don't realize how much we absolutely adore Nick. He is our person behind the scenes who does. Uh, all of the technical things. So we count on him to figure out things like this because while that's all coming in, um, we still need to keep you guys entertained and interested too. So uh, if you guys would like to reinforce Nick by writing thank you in the description section or in the comments, I am sure he would absolutely love that. But it sounds like we have our winner picked out. I, I think so. Oh, I, you know what? I think I'm going to split this. Yeah, I would pick Shelly. We'll go... I would pick Shelly. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> Debbie, maybe we can hold Debbie to a higher standard because we know that she's a professional trainer. Oh, Deb. <laughs> but, but, Deb, don't be mad. <laughs> well, we're going to do a Shelly. What? That, that's sort of what we were talking about before. When you bridge a behavior, you want to make sure you are bridging the appropriate behavior. We're going for a, a, a wave, not a wave. That's right. There you go. And All Debbie right. Well, how to wave. Debbie does know how to wave. And she does it really <laughs> well. Um, so, okay, Shelly. Shelly, I know you've got um, a house full of twos, don't you? So... I'm going to say I would be happy to send you um, a, 
I would be happy to send you a extra large birch tree. Um, and we just message. I think I probably have um, your your um, address, but if I don't, message that to me, and we will. Um, I will get that out to you. It might be a couple days. Um, we're working on drying some birch that we went and harvested this morning. So um, yeah, I a big thank you to Nick. Nick, you are incredible, um, and you are what make. Jack and I look good. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have an idea I just need to throw out there. Um, I've been talking to um, Quentin on Facebook a little bit, and we were talking about Quentin's got a house full of parts, and he doesn't know what to do with them. Um, and so we were talking a little bit about maybe doing something like a Zoom call where people, you know, like for a very, very, very nominal fee, like $5, um, we could do a Zoom call and we could brainstorm um, some foraging toy ideas. So if you guys are interested in that, leave us a message in the comments and if, um, or you can message either one of us um, and just let us know. Cause it's, I mean, it's a lot of fun to get together and talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so Nick's not only helping us, Jack, Nick is helping numerous people out there. So um, way to go, Nick. Um, and <laughs> any final words on the language of behavior, Jack? You know, I think the important thing to remember here, it's really easy to get bogged down in the terminology. And what I'm going to tell you right now, Robin and I, as we've been talking uh, I have been talking to other animal trainers that I know and trying to come up with the definitions of these terms and remembering these terms. These are people that are having to remember back 10, 15, 20 plus years. And, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, you don't need the definition right there at the forefront of your brain to be able to utilize these approaches to your training. So. It's always good to learn the terminology, to have a better sense of what you are doing, but don't get bogged down in the terminology um, because as we've discovered, as we talked, um, you may not even be right. Like if, if you think something is a reinforcer um, and the animal views it as a punishment, that, that could be changing how your thinking of your training is going. Ultimately, it won't change how the training itself is going. You're going to be using the same tools in the toolbox to approach that uh, situation. So mm -hmm. I am just very, very excited that so many people were able to watch this session tonight. Um, now, if you guys haven't seen any of the other sessions that Robin and I have done, you can check those out on the High Redbird YouTube channel, along with all the other tutorials that I do. Uh, but I do want to recommend that you guys come over to the Leather Elves page on Friday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's when we do the live streams. So everyone can participate, ask questions. Uh, if you have any other suggestions for topics, we would be thrilled to hear them. But once again, you guys have made tonight an absolutely thrilling evening. So I do want to thank you guys all so much for being a part of it. It has been great. And I, I do want to thank you all too. Um, it's sometimes tough. This is a tough subject, you know, some of it's a little dry and I'll be honest as Jack and I were going through what we were going to do, there was a lot of discussion and it, this could have been a snore fest, but you guys really, um, your participation makes us, um, do better. So thank you. And I just want to let you know next week is, um, We've got a great topic for next week. It's what to expect from a veterinary visit. Um, and we may have a surprise guest. One never knows. Um, but, uh, yeah, right. Um, so same time, uh, you know, and the, the, we record them and put them on High Redbird and they're on the Leather Elves page as well. So if you want to go back and check it out, don't forget the terms are available on the leatherelves.net. Um, and you can go there and just, you print it out for yourself. Um, I am a visual hold it in my hand kind of person. Um, I learn better that way. 
So that's available there. And Jack has great resources on High Redbird. So congratulations to Melissa for tonight. Um, thank you for participating, Melissa. And um, also to Shelly. Shelly, get in touch and we will get that to you. And um, we will see you guys next week at 7 p.m. Eastern time on the Leather Elves Facebook page. Take care. Good night. I do need to say thank you to my Patreon patrons for helping to make these videos possible. You can find out more by visiting High Red Bird on Patreon or clicking the link in the description section down below if you would like more information. Thanks! Mm -hmm.